Live from San Diego, California, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back, this is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2019 in San Diego, 12,000 in attendance. I'm Stu Min, and my co-host is John Trier, and welcome back to the program, a multi-time CUBE alumni, Yorona Aviv, who is the CTO and co-founder of Iguazio. We've had Thank quite you. a lot of you know, founders, CTOs, you know, they're, <laughs> they're big brains at this show, uh, yep. your own. So, you know, let, let, let's start, you know, there, there's, there's really a gathering, uh, there's a lot of effort building out, you know, a very complex complicated ecosystem. G give us first kind of your overall impressions of the, the, the show in this ecosystem. Yeah, so we're very early on on this ecosystem. We were one of the first, in the first batch of CNCF members when there were a few dozens of those, not like a thousand of those. Uh, so I've been, I've been to all those shows. Uh, we're part of the CNCF committees for different things and, and initiating, I think this has become much more mainstream. I told you before, it's sort of the new VMworld. You know, a lot, a lot more. Uh, all the infrastructure vendors, along with middleware and application vendors, are coming here. All right. Yeah. So, so one of the things we like having you on the program, your own, is you don't pull any punches. So, we've seen certain waves of technology come with big promise and, and, and fall short. You know, big data was going to allow us to leverage everything, and you know, a large percentage of uh, so, so solutions, you know, ha had to stop or be pulled back. Um, give us, what, what's the cautionary tale that we should learn and make yeah, sure that we don't repeat? You know, so I've been in CTO for many years in different companies and, and what everyone used to say about me is I'm always right, I'm only uh, one year off usually. <laughs> I'm usually a little more optimistic. So you know, we've been talking about Cloudera and uh, Hadoop World sort of going down and, and Kubernetes and cloud services essentially replacing them. We were talking about it four years ago. And, and what you see that's actually happening, you know, with the collapse of Mepar and Hortonware going into Cloudera, things are going down. Customers are now telling us, we need equivalent solution for Kubernetes. We're not going to maintain two clusters. So I think, in general, we've been uh, picking on many of those friends. We've, we've invented serverless before it was even called serverless with, with Nucleo, and now we're expanding it further. And now we see the new emerging trends really around machine learning and AI. That's sort of the big thing. Uh, I'm surprised, you know, that's our space. We're essentially doing a data science platform as a service, fully automated around serverless constructs so people can, can uh, develop things really, really quickly. And what I see that, you know, third of the people I talk to are, have some relations to machine learning and AI. Yeah, maybe explain that for our audience a little bit because when, you know, Kubernetes first started, very much an infrastructure discussion, but in the last year or two, uh, very much application specific. We hear many people talking about those data use cases, AI and ML early days, but you know, how, how does that fit into the overall yeah, discussion but it, here? Yeah, but it's simple. You know, there, if you're moving to the cloud, there are two workloads. There's lift and shift workloads and there are new workloads, okay? Lift and shift, why, why bother moving them to Kubernetes, okay? So you end up with new workloads. Everyone is trying to be cloud natives or elastic services and all that. Everyone has to feed data and machine learning into those new applications. This is why you, you see those trends that talk about all data integration, various frameworks and all that in that space. So I don't think it's by coincidence. I think it's that's because new applications incorporate intelligence, that's why you hear a lot of the talk about those things. Yeah. You're, I, what I loved about the architecture, what you just said, is like people don't want to run another cluster. I don't want to run two versions of Kubernetes. You know, if I'm moving there, you because you but you're still built on that that kind of infrastructure framework and, and knowledge of, of how to do serverless and how to make more nodes and fewer nodes and, and persistent storage and all that sort of good stuff and, uh, and and run TensorFlow and run you know all these all these big data apps. But you can, um, can can talk about that just as a as a the advantage to your customer because you could it seems like you could you could run it on top of GKE you could run it on prem I could run my own Kubernetes you could yep. you could just give me a, a, a yeah, stack so, so we yeah. we say Kubernetes is not interesting I yeah. don't know, I don't want anyone to get offended <laughs> okay but Kubernetes is not the big deal the big deal is organizations want to be competitive in this sort of digital world they need to build new applications old ones are sort of in sort of a maintenance mode. And the big point is about delivering new application with elastic scaling because your your customers may maybe a million people behind some sort of a, you know uh, app. Okay, um, so that's the key thing. And Kubernetes is a way to deliver those microservices. But what we we figured out it's still very complicated for people. 
okay? Especially in the data science world, uh, it takes about a few weeks to deliver a model on a Jupyter notebook, whatever, and then productizing it is about a year. That's something we've seen, between six months to a year to productize things that are relatively simple, okay? And that's because people think about the container, the TensorFlow, the CUDA driver, whatever, how to scale it, how to make it perform, et cetera. So what we came up with is, traditionally there's a notion of serverless, which is abstraction with very slow performance, very limited set of use cases. We said serverless is about elastic scaling, paper use, full automation around DevOps and all that, okay? Why cannot apply to other use cases of really high concurrency, high speed, batch, you know, distributed training, distributed workloads? Because we're coming, if you know my background, you know, been VP in, in Mellanox and other high performance companies. So we're, I have a, we have a high performance DNA. So we, we don't know how to build things that are extremely slow. It sort of irritates me. So the point is that how can we apply this notion of abstraction and scaling and all that to a variety of workloads? And this is essentially what Iguazu did. There's a combination of high-speed data technology for like you know moving data around on between those functions and extremely high-speed set of functions that work on the different domains of data collection and ingestion, data analytics, you know, machine learning training and machine learning model serving. So a customer can come on, on our platform and we have testimonials around that that you know, things that they thought about building on Amazon or even on-prem for months and months, they built in our platform in few weeks with fewer people. Because the focus is on building the application. The focus is not about tuning your Kubernetes. Now, we go to customers, some of them are large banks, etc. They say, our IT likes Kubernetes, we have our own Kubernetes. So, you know what, we don't bother. Initially, we, we used to bring our own Kubernetes, but then, you know, I don't mind. You know, we, we do struggle sometimes because our level of expertise in Kubernetes is way more sophisticated than what they, they have. To so say, okay, we've installed Kubernetes and we come with our software stack. No, you didn't, you know, you didn't configure the security, you didn't configure ingress, etc. So sometimes it's easier for us to bring, but we don't want to get into this sort of tension with IT. Our focus is to accelerate development on the new application that are intelligent, you know, move applications from, if you think of the traditional data analytics and data science, it's about reporting. And what people want to do, and some applications we've uh, announced this week, an application around real-time cyber collection, it's being used in some different governments, is that you can uh, collect a lot of uh, information, SMS, telephony, video, et cetera, and in real time you could detect terrorists, okay? So those applications requires high concurrency, always on, rolling upgrades, Things that weren't there in the traditional BI Oracle, you know, kind of reporting way. So you have this wave of putting intelligence into more highly concurrent online application. It requires all the DevOps sort of aspects, but all the data analytics and machine learning aspects to, to come to come along. All right, so your own. Speaking of those workloads, uh, for for machine learning, uh, Kubeflow is the project uh, moving the, moving that space along. G give us the update there. Yeah, so, so uh, there is sort of a rising star in the Kubernetes community around how to automate machine learning workflow, that's Kubeflow. Uh, I'm personally one of the committers in Kubeflow, and what we've done, because it's very complicated, because Google developed uh, Kube, uh, Kubeflow as one of the services on, on uh, GKE, okay? And they tweaked everything, it works great in GKE, even that it's relatively new technology, and people want to move run it in a more generic. So one of the things in our platform is a managed Kubeflow, that works natively with all the rest of the solutions. Another thing that we've done is we make it, we made it fully serverless. So instead of Kubeflow approach is very, con, you know, Kubernetes oriented, containers, YAMLs, all that. Uh, in our flavor of Kubeflow, you can just create functions and you just like chain functions and you click and it runs. So to just, you, you've mentioned a, a couple of times, uh, you know, how does serverless as you define it fit in with uh, Kubernetes? Is, is that, that working together, just functions <coughs> on top, or you know, I'm just trying to make Again, sure we parse and understand. Here you'll, you'll hear different things. I think when most people say serverless, yeah. they, they mean sort of front-end application, things that are sort of low concurrency, et cetera. You know, for, uh, when we mean serverless, it's we have eight different engines that each one is very good in, in different uh, domain, like distributed deep learning, you know, distributed machine learning, et cetera. And, and we know how to fit the thing into any workload. So for me, uh, we deliver the elastic scaling, the paper use, and the ease of use of sort of no DevOps across all the eight workloads that we're, we're addressing. 
for most people it's like a single trick phony. And, and I think really the future is, is moving to that. And if you think about serverless, there's another aspect here, which is very important for machine learning, and is reusability. I'm not going to develop any algorithm in the world. Okay, there are a bunch of companies or users that, or developers that can develop an algorithm and I can just consume it. So the future in data science, but not just data science, is essentially to have like marketplaces of algorithms pre-made or analytic tools or maybe even vendors licensing their technology through a sort of pre-packaged solution. So we're a great believer of forget about the infrastructure, focus on the business components and daisy chain them into a pipeline like you for pipeline and run them and that will allow you most reusability, the you know, lowest amount of, of cost, best performance, et cetera. That's, uh, That's great, I just want to uh, double click on the serverless idea one more time, but so you're, you're developing, it's an architectural pattern, uh, and you're developing these co concepts yourself, you're not actually, sometimes the, the concept gets confused with the implementations of uh, other people's serverless frameworks or things like that, yeah. is, that is that correct? I think there are confusion, I'm, I'm getting asked a lot of times, how do you compare your technology uh, compared to let's say uh, Knative, you've heard the term. Mm -hmm. Knative is just a technology. Yeah, or OpenFAS. Or, yeah, yeah. OpenFAS <laughs> is a CGI sort of, it's an open community, it's very nice for hobbyists, but if you're an enterprise, you need security, LDAP integration, authentication for everything, you need UIs, you need CLIs, you need all of those things. So Amazon provides that with Lambda. Can you compare Lambda to Knative? No. You know, Knative is, I need to go from Git and build and, and all that. Serverless is about taking a function and clicking and deploying. It's not about building. And the problem is that this conference is about people, IT people, in front from people that like to build. So they, they don't like to get something that work. They want to get the build the Lego building block so they can play. So in our view, serverless is not open fast or K native, okay? It's something that you click and it works and have all the enterprise set of features. Uh, we've extended it to different levels of magnitude of performance. I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. We I did a comparison for a customer who was asking me the same question, not about K native, but this time Lambda. How do you guys compare with Lambda? Now, Nokia is extremely high performance, you know, we're doing up to 400,000 events on a single process. And the customer said, you know what, I have a use case, I need like 5,000 events per second, how do you guys compare, oh, a total across all my functions, how do you compare against uh, Lambda? We went into, you know, the price calculator, 5,000 events per second on Lambda, that's $50,000, okay, $50,000. We do about, let's say, even in um, simple functions, 60,000 per process, $500 VM on Amazon. $500 VM on Amazon with our technology, 60,000 transactions per second, 5,000 events per second on Lambda, that's 50,000, okay? 100 times more expensive. So it de depends on the design point. We design our solution to be extremely efficient, high concurrency. If you just need something to do a webhook, use Lambda, you know? If you are trying to build a high concurrency application, efficient, you know, an enterprise application on a, on a serverless architecture construct, come to us. Yeah, so, so just, uh, I, I'll, I'll posit this for you, because uh, it, it reminds me what you were talking about, about the builders here. In the early days of VMware, to get it to work the way I wanted to, people need to participate and build it. And there's the mm -hmm. IKEA effect. If I actually help build it a little bit, I like it more. Yes. Um, <laughs> to get to the vast majority uh, to uh, adopt those things, it needs to become simplified, and I can't have you know all the applications move over to this environment if I have to constantly tweak that and everything. So that's the trend we've been really seeing this year is some of that simplification needs to get there. There's focus on you know the operators, the day two operations, the applications, so that anybody can get there without having to build themselves. So we know there's still work to be done, um, but if we've crossed the chasm and we want the majority to now adopt this, it can't be that I have to customize it. It needs to be more turnkey. Yeah, and I think it's a different in attitude between what you'll see in Amazon reInvent in a couple of weeks and, and what you see here. Because is there is also the focus, of we're building application. Uh, what kind of tools Andy Jess is going to uh, just launch today on the on the floor, okay? So we can just consume it and build our new application. They're not thinking, how did Andy Jesse build his tools, okay? And I think that's the opposite here. It's like, how can, you know, how is Istio working inside underneath the hood? Who cares about Istio, you know? Do you care about having connectivity between two points and, 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 all, and all that? How do you implement it? That, you know, let someone else uh, take care of it and then you can apply your few people that you have on solving your business problem. 
not on infrastructure. You know, I just met a, a guy came to our booth. We've seen uh, our demo. Pretty impressive how we the right field function and it scales and does everything automatically. He said, we want to build something like you're doing. You know, not really. Like only 10% of what you just showed me. And we have about six people. And for three months, we're just like scratching our head. I said, okay, you could use our platform, pay us some software license, and now you'll get you know, 10 times more functionality and your six people can do something more useful. Says, right, let's do a POC. So, so that's our intention and I think people are starting to get it because Kubernetes is not easy. Again, people tell me, we installed Kubernetes, now install your stack and then they haven't installed like 20% of all the things that you, you need to install. So, well, Yaron Haviv, always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks for the, all the updates and uh, I know we'll catch up with you again soon. Sure. All right, for John Troyer, I'm Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more coverage here from KubeCon, CloudNativeCon in San Diego. Thanks for watching theCUBE. Mm -hmm.